All right. Good. So I got another couple of minutes. Let me see if there's anything else important to mention about the uh, the news. That thing is kind of in the way, but it's an acceptable sacrifice. Excuse me, I have to call that uh, Apple phone. Then will it go to the last uh, only wire, wireless stations? Yeah, this only applies to wireless networks. So every time you turn on an iPhone, for example, it advertises the last five wireless networks. At least it used to. I haven't tested it in a few years, but I don't think I've ever heard of anybody ever fixing it. Um, Mt. Gox is not gone because Mt. because they have to pay off their creditors. Mt. Gox is passing through the legal system. The original people that crashed and lost all the bitcoins, they have some bitcoins left, and they've been selling them large quantities of bitcoins to pay off their creditors. And because Bitcoin got so high, they've actually paid them more than 100% of the money they owed. But they didn't crash the price of Bitcoin by selling so many all at once. This is why if you are a real major Bitcoin investor, they're like a religious cult, and one of their mantras is you can never sell, you have to hold. Because if any of them actually start selling, it'll crash. Because the, this guy here, David Gerard, wrote a very good book. And the point is, as in terms of financial instruments, Bitcoin is thin. There were actually only a very small number of investors and a very small number of people selling. So the market price is not actually based on much reality. Any one actor can totally manipulate the price, and it's happening all the time. So uh, the biggest... What's that? You have to go through... And you can trade Bitcoin for other cryptocurrencies very easily. To sell it and turn it into real currency is very difficult. You can do it at Coinbase, and you can do it at a few offline exchanges, but most of them keep getting shut down by governments. It's not impossible to sell, but it is difficult. There's only a few places you can go. And one of the main ones is Bitfinex, and they are totally manipulating the price. They've been controlling the price really drastically for the last six months. They pumped it up to 20000 It's um. That's why when, it, when the price changes, it is not because a real market is deciding it so much as it's a few players manipulating it to milk you for money. That's right. You know, I would stay you're very wise to stay clear of it. Anytime anything is a pile of money for free, you're being a sucker. You're not really going to get that money. It's a scam of some sort. And the whole thing is a giant pyramid scheme, essentially. Anyway, now we're up to the official time here. So, um, all right. So I put the scores out of, um, I took the scores out of Canvas because the Canvas system is really not working, especially for these large classes, but really not for much of anything. It's pretty crummy stuff. And put it back in Excel. So I put the scores here. Now, since you have not registered, you don't necessarily have student IDs. So your code is the MD5 of your email address. And until this morning, these were incorrectly sorted, so these hashes didn't go with the right scores. And three people complained, saying, wait a minute, I don't have the right number of points. So I found the problem this morning, and I fixed it. So if you take the MD5 of your email address, your scores should be here. And the total number of points I planned for is 600. So if you get 540, that's an A. And there's one student that already has done enough to get an A. And quite a few that are not far behind, 490 and such. So that's fine. And I'll, uh, this person only needs like less than 30 to get an A. So I'm, I'm going to have to make some kind of like online certificate that you get when you win. I'll work on that. I haven't, I need to choose some art and make like a little badge or something you get. Since I can't, you're not getting official credit. Although if you want official credit, you can register next semester at college and get credit. But I, I think a lot of people here don't really want to register at the college, but they might like to put a badge on their website or something saying they passed the course. Because uh, of privacy. I don't want to be rude. Not everybody's email address should be published to the whole world. So this was, yes, this was my, this was my attempt to prevent it. So hopefully this will meet a reasonable balance between. Uh, that still is, no, that's not very secret at all. Your username is closely connected. If you, that's how they caught all the people in Nullsec from the username. That's actually, really a big privacy intrusion. Your username usually ties all the way back to your real address very easily. It's a, so I didn't want to, this is, this is my attempt. I'm trying to make an anonymous identifier. And if anybody has any other ideas about it, I'm interested. Anyway, so we're up to 64-bit assembly. We've talked all in this class for a long time about how to do 32-bit exploits, and I said we would eventually get around to doing 64-bit exploits, and now's the time. So if you have 64-bit registers, 
um, then two things happen. The registers are, of course, longer. And the second thing that is not necessarily obvious is there are a lot more of them. 16 registers on a 64-bit processor. This turns out to have large effects on the assembly code you can make because a lot of 32-bit assembly code involves shoving things around to free up the registers for use. And here, you very often do not have to do that. You can just use the registers. So the reason why this diagram shows half colors for the first ones is these also have 32-bit portions. You may remember from the 32-bit registers we talked about, you can do E, AX for the 32-bit A, and you can do AL and AH for 8-bit portions, and you can do AX for a 16-bit portion. You can refer to registers in smaller pieces, 32, 16, or 8 bits at a time, but if you don't do that, you use the address starting with an R that refers to the 64-bit register. And so here you go. There's names for the 64-bit, the 32-bit, the lower 16, and the lower 8. And those are for backward compatibility. If you actually want to run 8-bit code, you could to some extent. At least you can refer to 8 bits at a time in an instruction if you want to. So Windows, here's another gruesome thing. 2 to the 32 bits is 4 gigabits. And that's why 32-bit machines can only address 32 gigabyte, 4 gigabytes of memory. And that's one reason why a lot of people upgraded to 64-bit, because they have more than four gigabytes of RAM, and you can't really get the full value of that unless you have a 64-bit processor. But 64 is a giant leap up from 32. And so it turns out that so-called 64-bit processors do not actually implement all 64 bits of the address. Not at all. <coughs> Windows Server. What's that? No, four gigabytes is 32 bits. And that's, how, that's the maximum amount of RAM you can address with 32 bits of address space. That's the problem. So if you have more than four gigabytes of RAM on your computer and you run a 32-bit OS, it can't use it all at once. It has to page it. And if, but if you have a 64-bit machine, it can use more, but not that much more. Since it, this only goes from 32 up to 44 bits, so it can only address 16 terabytes of RAM. Now that is probably a reasonable business decision because that's probably all the RAM you can afford, but it kind of fails the math mathematical test. Now they run up to 48 bits, and that's where we are now. So it doesn't actually use all 64 bits to address anything. And that means it would have to choose how to do it. And the way they do it is by using two sections of RAM that are completely separated. They use low numbers and high numbers and the dead zone in the middle that you can't refer to. That's how it's actually done. So there's a bunch of addresses that start with a bunch of Fs and a bunch of addresses that start with a bunch of zeros, and that's it. There's the 48-bit, there's the 56-bit version. 64-bit addressing would actually do it all. You can't buy anything that does that. What you get is this or that. And you'll see it in the debugger. When you look at addresses, your stack is up at FFFF and your code is down at 007. It's kind of, or maybe the other way, it's kind of screwy. Uh, actually, everything I see is down here in this part. But anyway, the, um, all right, so now, remember we had int 80 for system calls. Now there's a thing called syscall. And one of the many things that benefits from having more registers is passing data into subroutines. In 60, in 32 bit code, you typically just have one or two parameters and they are pointers that point to data structures and you pass in data structures on the stack. But in 64 bit code, you pass all the arguments in with registers typically. And, um, let me see if I can get this thing off my screen. If I can't, I, my pointer, mouse pointer is gone. There. All right. There. Okay. Um, anyway. All right. So here's what you can, there's a syscall table you can get online that will show you how these work. And here's an example, sysread and syswrite. So to write, you pass in RDI, RSI, and RDX. So RDI, it points to a file pointer, this points to the string you're going to print, and this points to the size of data to print. That's what you do. Everything comes in in uh, registers. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, some student told me, I'm going to mute people. Some student told me how to mute them automatically, but it just totally doesn't work. Anyway. Um, all right. So. 
Yes. There are 64-bit Linux and 64-bit Windows. And they both have similar restrictions. So uh, here's the Intel developer zone, which tells you more about the registers. And there's a, a link to it that gives you all the details of how to refer to all these different areas. But you don't really need that for what we're doing here. It's just there in case you want to get into more of it. So the op codes for 64-bit are very much like 32-bit. You've got move, exchange data, multiply, increment, decrement, compare, no op is still there, and so on. And or not, just the usual stuff. Um, so you can use syscalls to get things done. Here's the first syscall, write, that will take these three parameters. So here's what you do to write text to the console. Set RAX to 1 to specify the write. The RA determines what you're doing. RAX is here. Then set RDI to 1, the pointer to a standard out. Then you push the string onto the stack. Then you set RSI to RSP, so it points to the top of the stack where you just pressed something. Then you set RDX to the length of the string, and now you call syscall. So you have to set several registers to get ready. Um, all right, so now we can start writing assembly language code. So let me bring these up live. They should be on my virtual machine here. And that should be, I don't think that's the right address. Okay, let me find out. Oh, that's right, I don't need to use my 64-bit collie. I can actually use copy and paste. There's the 32-bit that they seem to have broken VMware tools. 64 works for some reason. So here, okay, uh, I think it's ABC1, okay? Okay, so what I got here, I have a text section. That's the only section of my code. Remember, if you, don't, you need a text section, that's where the assembly language instructions go. Here's where it starts. This defines the existence of a label named start, and here's where the label named start is. So here's what I do. I move A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H into RAX. And since it's a 64-bit register, I need eight bytes to do it. Then, now I just do exactly what I described. I push this string onto the stack. Now, I put the length of the string here, the address to the string here, one, because I'm doing syscall one, which is right, and one, because I'm writing to standard out, which is a pointer of one. Then I do syscall. That's all I've done here. So if I run that, I have to compile it first, which I do with yasm minus elf 64, minus f, I think, yeah, elf, 64, which is 64-bit Linux assembly code, and then it's abc1.sm. Okay, that creates um, abc1.out. So you can run it, and when you do, it prints the letters I told it to print, and then it has a segmentation fault. Now, the reason it has segmentation fault is I did not return. I just stopped, so it crashed. Notice that the characters came through backwards, because it's still little endian, even though it's 64 bits. So when I put in the characters, they go in right to left in the 64-bit word, just like we've been doing in all of our exploits so far. So we have to add an exit to make it stop crashing. Now, exit is also in the syscall table. Let me zoom this up to here. There. Exit is 60. So here, I have to set RAX to 3C, which is 60 and then um, call syscall. So let's add that, and that gives me abc2. So if I nano abc2.assembler, I have exactly the same stuff here, where I set these four parameters and call syscall, and then I have one more where I just set rax and call syscall again. Now it should exit normally. So if I compile that one the same way, which is here, and then run that one, now it prints it and returns without crashing, which is all I want. So now I've done a, a couple of things. So now we can put the letters in order. One simple way to put the letters in order is just load them the other way. This is the normal way you would load it, as you see in the debugger, right to left. That should print them in order. <coughs> and that's ABC3. All it does is reverse that order. So if you compile that one, 
and run it. Now A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H are in order and it returns so things are under control. So now we could use a data section. We've been loading eight bytes in an eight byte register, which is fine, but a normal, more professional way to do it for more flexibility is to use a data section. So that's hello. .asm. All right, so you define now, in addition to a text section, we're going to make a data section, and that's going to have string called hello world, and I'm going to end with a line feed. So it will not just have the Kali prompt right after it there. So this is now 5, 10, 11, 12, 13 bytes of data. And another advantage of using a data section and a string variable is now I can have any length I want. So now, the length of the string is 13, so I put that in RDX. I fill this to a pointer to string one, and this is my assembler doing the work for me. My assembler will create this section, give it an address, put it somewhere, and remember the name of that pointer and put that in here so I don't have to figure out where it is. It'll do that for me. Then I put the one in here for syscall one and the one in here for output device one and call it to print, and then I exit the same way I did before. So that's hello.asm. So if I do compile hello with yasm and then run hello, now I get hello world enter line feed. So I now made it finally up to hello world, the classic place where you start for everything. Honestly, this reminds me when I first did assembler in the 70s, no, it's early 80s on a 8 bit processor, 6502. The first thing I did was print one at sign on the screen. It was like, one of the formative moments of my life. I can do anything. I can. When watching write assembler, you really control your machine. You have to. Right. Yeah. Everything is eight bytes long. Yeah. So we can look at that file with obj dump minus x, and it'll show you that it is file format sixty four bits. And it'll show you the symbol table. Here's the text section and the data section. Remember before, if you, in all our exploits, everything was near 400,000. And here it is. It's still near 400,000, but everything starts with a whole bunch of zeros because all the addresses are 64 bits. So the assembler uh, chose to put my text section at 400,000 and my data section at 600,000, and on it goes. It also found that start label at 400,000 B0 and here's the end label and so on. This is what the assembler did to build the thing, was um, define some regions of memory, fill in the pointers and connect it to the operating system so you can launch it and leave. All right, so now we can use GDB. It's exactly the same program and the same logic works. And you may remember we use info proc map to see what's in here. So let's uh, use GDB on the hello. GDB on hello dot out. So here we are. I can do info proc map. Uh, oh, do I have to run it? Didn't I have to I put a breakpoint at the start. All right, run. I guess I have to run it. Okay, fine. We'll run it. Oh, I put a breakpoint. That's right. That's what I did. Break at a start. And now run. Which is by the way what um Ollie Debug does automatically, and I don't know why GDB doesn't. It puts a breakpoint at the start and runs to get it set to go so you can look at it. For some reason, GDB does not do that automatically. If they ask me, it should do that automatically. But anyway, now I can do info proc map and I can see the structure. So here's um, one part of it and another. Here's the stack down here. The stack is up here at 7FFF. I was, before, I said the stack is up in that high part of memory, but I realized that's not true. The stack is at the high end of the low part of memory. 7FFF. That's where it shows us to put it, up here. And you see it's pretty small, 21,000 hex. That's the stack. Here's the other section. This is the text section and this is the data section. Although it's not telling me that there, I know, happen to know that's true. All right. And so you can see them here in the text and data sections. You can examine them to see what's there. So I could do x slash 20x at 0x40. 400,000. And so this stuff is um, the assembly code, I'm pretty sure. And let's take a look at the 60,000, see how that looks. 600,000. That's down here. They're both looking the same. Let me see what I did here. Um, 
This one was machine language instructions and that was text. Oh, I had to go to the right address B0. I'm looking at the start of a section. I'm finding like some kind of section mark. What I have to do is go to these labels that we saw before where things actually start, which was 40B0 and 600D8. So let's do that. 400B0, there. Now you're seeing that kind of stuff. And the reason why this looks like random characters with a lot of zeros is that's assembly code. So let's look at it not as hexadecimal, but as instructions. And now you can see these are instructions, move things around, syscall. This is the assembly code we wrote. Here it is putting one in RAX, one in RDI and syscall. Here it is putting three C in RAX and syscall. That is the program we wrote, assembled and then disassembled in the debugger. And the strings are down at six, four zeros, and D8. Six, four zeros, and D8. And that's ASCII text. You can see it if you know your ASCII 6666 C. And you can also put it here as, I think, S, 20 C for characters. Okay, there, H-E-L-L-O, space. And down here is the character turn and then the null terminator. Okay, I saw a comment coming in the chat. Why didn't you show us that slide earlier? Oh, the C? Character. Yeah, I saw you. I don't know, but it's available. Yeah, if you need to do that. It's just an annotation. We're working with 64-bit. It's nice to always use the G modifier um, for inspecting memory. Oh, yes, yes, uh, G and also W. Let's take a look at that. X, G, X, R, S, P. Um, X slash G, X, R, S, P. Yeah, see, that's... We'll get there a little bit later, but I might as well do it now. If I put um, 10x, this is the way I've been doing it from 32-bit. This is showing me, actually still showing me 32-bit words. So maybe I'll see if this guy has a comment, because that's not what I expected. All right, um, G, you need the W because it defaults to G. Oh, okay, right, thank you. So see, to see what we had before, yeah, this is the kind of stuff we saw before. Remember this, four 32-bit words going across. But if you do the G instead, then you get two 64-bit words going across, which is more the way it really is. So they all mean the same thing, and you can get used to reading them either way. But this is really showing you 32-bit words, and that's showing you 64-bit words. Those are good points. Let's see if there's anything else coming in the chat here. Um, yeah, X slash 20WX. Yeah, good. All right. Good. Those are good points, and I appreciate the help. Don't be shy. Bring up anything good you've got to say, because I certainly don't know at all. All right. So there's info registers that shows you the contents. You, you'd see you've got uh, RSP and RIP. It's removed leading zeros in both cases. And uh, all right. So now we can use read. Read is just another syscall. So um, it's syscall zero to be read. And so it has to have uh, the length of the string, a pointer to the string. So let's just bring this up, read.asm. Let me go back to here. Come on, come on. Okay. Quit this. Nano read. Okay. So here we have a string, A-A-B-B-C-C-X. Reserving space for 10 characters, so I have four, and another four, and then two, and one more for the null byte at the end. So now I can store up to 10 characters of data. Now, I'm going to put the length of the string 10 bytes. I'm going to put a pointer to the string in RSI. Syscall zero is read, and the standard in file descriptor is zero. Remember, standard out was one, standard in is zero. So now when I do the syscall, it's going to read from the console, from the keyboard, and put it in there, up to 10 bytes. Now, I'm gonna write out what it got, with just what we've done before, syscall um, one to write with a standard out of one, and then exit. So this is exactly the same stuff we had before, the only thing new is we're gonna read something and echo it back. So let's compile that one with Yasm, and this is read. Okay, and if I run that, Right, I put in AAA and out comes AAA and then BBBCC because it took the enter that I pressed and treated it as the fourth character. 
So let's see what else fun we can have with that. Right, you can read in data, it reads in, and then there is extra junk at the end because I can't input the null terminator. And it doesn't put it there, so it's going to lead, it's going to have BBBCC at the end of it. Um, if I put in exactly 10 bytes, it'll come out correctly, but if I put in any smaller number, it'll have some leftover junk in there from the way I structured this program. But that's enough to do some simple things, and here's the Caesar cipher in assembler. Okay, so what it does is, I'm only going to be allowed to have eight characters in the code I'm going to decode, so I'll fit it in one 64-bit uh, section up here called string. Now I'm going to read in data. This reserves space for up to eight characters. Now I read in data, up to eight characters. Now I set RBX to point to the string, and I put the string's value in here. Now I just add 1111, which will move everything forward one step in the alphabet and then put it back and print it out. This is a really miserable sloppy Caesar cipher because it doesn't handle the wraparound. If you have a Z, it will turn into a semicolon or something instead of wrapping around to A, because I didn't even deal with that. But it will do something resembling the Caesar cipher for simple cases. So if you compile that, All right. Now, it's warning me that some value does not fit in a 32-bit field, but let's just go on without worrying about that and run it. So if I put in hello, I get back I-F-M-M-O, which is all one letter forward in the alphabet, plus some junk at the end. So that is what I expected. Uh, it does work, sort of, as a really sleazy Caesar cipher. And um, all right, that's so it works, but it only works for, oh, the O didn't move. That's what I wanted to show you. The O did not move forward. So this, notice this, and you can see it live. The O didn't go to P, L-M-N-O-P, and it should have. And the reason it didn't was because of this warning here. And this is one of the gotchas of assembly language programming. It let me write a program and then it didn't do what I told it to do. And we should be able to see that. Let me just try something. I think I can do it with objdump. Let me see. I don't know if I put that in the slides or not. But uh, I might be able to do it with objdump. Yeah, objdump minus D. Here, let's do that. Objdump minus D of Caesar dot out. There. Okay, look what happened. Remember, I added a 64-bit value with 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 8 of them. It only added four of them because there is no assembly language instruction to add a 64-bit immediate value to a register. This is the nasty thing. You only get certain instructions, and they aren't all there. That's what that warning meant. The warning said uh, can only fit 32 bits in that value. It only added a 32-bit 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 to it. It only changed the last four bytes, not all eight. That's, and the warning for that was this message I got here. Value does not fit in 32-bit fields. Add register immediate is a 32-bit assembler instruction. It is not a 64-bit assembler instruction, which is kind of rude. You would think that the 64-bit assembly space instructions would be a superset of the 32-bit, but it is not. It's just different. So I went to the developer's manual, and I looked at what ads exist. And I have an ad. I guess I can zoom it in here so you can see it in this room where the projector isn't much good. I can add register to something here, and I can add something here to 64. But what I can't do is add immediate. Here's an immediate value, but they don't, they don't exist in the 30, in the 64-bit space. I suppose this is because 64-bit immediate values are not much use. They would have a whole lot of extra zeros. But anyway, this is a, I couldn't find that instruction, and my assembler couldn't find that instruction either. So it warned me that it was not doing exactly what I asked it to do. So the only way to do it is to modify your program this way, where you use a register. Let me bring this one up live, Caesar 2, uh, here. Come on, okay, come on, okay. Don't 
don't have it. All right, I'll just use the slides. All right, so what you do is instead of adding this to RCX, I move it into R8 and then I add RH. That's what you have to do. You can move a 64-bit value into a register, but you cannot add a 64-bit value to a register. You have to do it in two steps. And I said, this is very common in 32-bit code that you very often have to use several instructions to shuffle things around to get what you want done because the instruction you need does not exist. This problem was much worse back in the days of 8-bit assembler. I used to write self-modifying code frequently there because the instruction that I needed did not exist. Anyway, um, now you get five bits, bytes that all move forward one. So that's, I wrote a, a project you can do here and there's some challenge, make it say hello from your name. So this one prints out that message, hello from your name, up here. And uh, make a seizure that moves everything back three steps. So hello turns into E-B-I-I-L. And you notice it turns um, some things into non-printable characters at the end. And uh, then there's XOR encryption. You might as well keep going. You can do single byte XOR. XOR everything with a byte, byte by byte. So CNET turns into a bunch of punctuation marks. Uh, those are the challenges. And uh, let me just point those out. So there's a project to go with this, of course, where you practice your 64-bit assembler. That's all I just did was work through the project. And it is the assembler here. So get a 64-bit machine, and I tested all this. This all works on 64-bit of the latest copy. It'll work on older ones, too. And so here's your, you just go through those things I did. Now, the next thing you probably want to do, of course, is exploit 64-bit windows. And that's what you do here, um, right here. Actually, 64-bit Linux that we're going to do. We're not going to exploit 64-bit windows, but we're going to exploit 64-bit Linux. So. I've got this one ready to go to, I think, um, p13.c. So let's take a look at that, you know, p13.c. Okay, there it is. Let me get rid of the colors. So here is, this is the thing I learned from uh, Georgia Weedman's book, never have the overflow in main, because returning from main is complicated and painful. Return from a subroutine to main, that's much easier to control. So main calls a vuln function. And then it prints by if you get back alive. And the vuln function defines a 400-bit verif buffer. And then um, it prints out RSP just so you can see where you are. I don't know if that's necessary, but I was in the habit. At one point, I wanted to do that for all the, the um, programs in this course to print out a register so you can see the difference between GDB and outside GDB and not have to guess about it. But anyway, now you have a server. It's going to read something and echo back whatever you said. That's all it does but it's going to read up to 800 bytes and put it in something 400 bytes long so you can overflow it. So there's that. And there's a, so I wrote a fuzzer to fuzz it, which is the usual thing here. So let me compile that. By the way, when you compile it, of course, you have to use NoPy. That's the new thing in modern versions of Kali. You have to use the dash dash, dash NoPy option by the way, I should explain these in case some people are asking about it. No pi means don't make a position independent executable, so the code is really up at 400,000 instead of all being at zero. No stack protector turns off the NX bit that we were talking about earlier today. So if you do manage to stick code on the stack, it will run. And uh, minus Z exec stack, I oh, this is what makes the stack executable. This is what doesn't have a canary. So it won't let me do buffer overflows from the stack. These two things together, make it possible to do the classic Aleph null kind of buffer overflow, which is what we're doing. This one is no position independent executable code, so it doesn't, otherwise it'll put all the code at address zero because it's planning to relocate it when you load. So this turns off address space layout randomization. This gets rid of a canary, and this gets rid of NX stack protection. A canary is a value that appears at the end of a stack frame so if it changes, it won't return. It protects the EIP in that fashion. That's what they call stack smashing detected. And that's, these are the modern defenses, which I just talked about this morning in the Windows, uh, in the general hacking class, and we turn them all off so we can use an old fashioned attack here. So let's compile this and run it. And there we go. All right, so when I run it, it asks for some text and you put it in. 
and you know it's going to work up to hundreds. So if I put in long stuff here, it'll still work. But if I feed in hundreds, it'll crash. So I need to make a fuzzer, and I've got it here. This prints 450. So if I run that, it prints 450. And if I pipe that into P13, now I get a seg fault. So that's what I wanted to see. 450 is apparently enough to fill the 400, and the 50 is enough to fill the rest of the stack frame and hit the EIP and crash. So I can do GDB. Uh, so let's put that in a file, make it easier. Uh, I think that's how I like to do it in this one. Let me see. There's different ways to do it. But yeah, I'll put it in a file called F. So I'll run the fuzzer and put that in a file called F. Now if I do LS minus L, I can see that the file F is 451 bytes long, 450 A's and a carriage return at the end. Now if I GDB the P13 file and run it from F, it's going to crash and give me a segmentation fault at this address. Now, in the past, with 32-bit code, we would see the overflow EIP right there. And the reason why we don't here is because it can't put that address in EIP because remember, you can't put all the addresses in EIP. So if I do X, this is something I like doing, uh, 10i, 10i, dollars RIP minus 10. This is a little bit sloppy, but it usually shows me, oops, 10i. It usually shows me the current machine language instructions and a few around it. So I'm in the process of doing a return, which is where I would expect a normal buffer overflow exploit to crash but it's unable to return. Let's see what's in the registers. And you see our DX is full, our BP is full of 41s. Now, if you remember what happens at the end of a, of a routine, when you're done executing a subroutine and you return, there are two stored values. The first thing you do is restore our BP from the saved our BP to move the, to the other stack frame. And the next thing you restore is the extended instruction pointer, in this case, RIP, from the saved instruction pointer. So it tried, it did get this far and try to put this value in the base pointer, but it could not put that value in the instruction pointer because it's not a legal value. You can have another pointer contain a 64-bit number like that because you might be using it for math or something, but a pointer can't contain this value because it's not legal, remember. We're only using 40, 56 bytes or something, bits of the 64 bits. So this address with 41s way over on the left is in the middle. It's not accessible. So your code will crash before it does that. You cannot use this simple test to detect a buffer overflow exploit anymore. All right. That's the point of it. So the way to do it, of course, is to put a breakpoint in. So you see before that, you can see what's going on. So we disassemble the vulnerable function and we find the thing that causes the crash and break afterwards. So let's go here, disassemble, vuln. Okay, here's the vulnerable function. As always, you start from the right and look for things you can read. Here it prints out a message. Here it prints out some other message. Here's where it reads something. This is where the overflow happens. It reads 450 bytes in where only 400 will fit. So Vuln plus 69 is after the overflow, but before it tries to return and crashes. So I can break there. Break Vuln plus 69. Now I can run it, getting my data from F. Start over again. Now it hits the breakpoint. Now I can do info registers and see RSP and RBP like before. It's E040 to E1, E0. I can now do x slash 120x RSP. And I'm going to, the bottom of the stack is at E1, E0. So that is going to be down here. E1, E0 is that. That's the stack frame. I'm going up to the top. I put in all these A's. This here is the stored EBP, which I've overwritten. And this is the stored EIP. Now, to make that more clear, let me modify my code a little. Disassemble vuln. Because it occurs to me that might not be obvious. Let's go back here. This is the instruction that's going to overflow. Let's break before also at vuln plus 64. So if I break at vuln plus 64 and now run it again, 
starting over. Here's the stack before the crash. Info registers. Now RSP goes from E040 to E1, E0. So if I do that X120, okay, and look for E1, E0, which is on the second page, it is here. So this is the condition of a healthy stack that hasn't had an overflow yet. And that's what I wanted to show you. This address right here with four zeros and then seven FFF, FFE0200, that is the stored EBP, which is the other stack frame for the main routine. That's what it'll copy in to move the stack frame back to where it belongs for the main routine. And this is the stored instruction pointer, which is very much like what you would see in a 32-bit code, 4005 EA, with a lot of zeros at the start. So when I overwrite it, I'm going to put eight A's on top of this and eight A's on top of that. And when it hits the return, it's going to copy this into EBP, which will succeed. And then it's going to try to copy this into EIP, which will crash because EIP cannot have a value that starts with 4141. It, has to, it can only have values that start with all Fs or all zeros because the other memory locations are illegal. So that's what I wanted to show you. That's how it works. All right. So now we can make an attack that targets it more precisely. You can see from right here that I overran by two A's here and one, two, three, four times 16, 18 A's. So the number of A's I put in hit the EIP and then had 18 A's after it. So I can very quickly, accurately target the EIP. I just have to modify that. If I, if I look at my fuzz program, that was 450, and I know that went 18 past the EIP. So I made um, another program, which I called uh, attack. All right, let me find out what I called it here. I skipped a couple steps here because I realized I could make it simpler. That's explaining this one here was uh, find. I did not even need to do find. I was able to hit that one with, I think it was find. Okay, so let's now find there. Okay, so all I did was take the 450 and take away 18 and then take away eight more and put in eight bytes there. This should put 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 on the EIP because I was able to see from the code I had how many bytes I was off. And I said, I remember this one worked. So if I run find and put it in F, say, and then I GDB quietly P13 and then uh, disassemble vuln and I break after the overflow at vuln plus 69 and run from F. Okay, info registers. Again, E1, E040 to E1, E0 and now X slash 120X RSP I'm looking for E1, E0, which is here, and you can see it worked. Here's the 64-bit value, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So now I can hit the RIP. So now, finishing the exploit is a pretty much a mechanical process, just like what we've done before. All I have to do is make uh, a dummy attack file, which I put in attack1 here. Um, Okay, so here all I did was I put something I can spot in the instruction pointer, and before that I put in an op sled of 100 bytes and then CC of 200 bytes and however much is left to fill this up. Just be, remember, you always have to do this because I need to find out where the nops are. So I print all that. That's attack one. So I'll run attack one and put that in F, and then GDB. Oops. Attack one. Okay, now GDB uh, minus Q P thirteen, and now um, break star vuln plus sixty nine. I think works. And now run from F. And now I hit here again. The stack goes to E one E zero, so it's X one twenty X. RSP, and I'm looking for E1, E0. So here's the NOP sled. Here's my dummy shell code. 
E1, E0 ends here. There's the one, two, three, it is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So now I can choose what address to put there. And the address to put there is something back here. So like that, 7FFF E060, that would be a good address or 70. Then I'll be jumping back there. So let's make that one. Um, that's attack two. Okay, so 7FFF E070 is the address I'm gonna put in. Notice that there are two bytes of zeros at the start of this. The real address here is this. Okay, that's the actual 64-bit address I'm jumping to. So I put that actual 64-bit address in here. Now, th there ought to be some rebellion at this point. What's going wrong here? What's gonna happen with that byte? That's right. This byte will never go in because this null byte would be the null terminator. And we are doing something here that you can do, but it's good to understand what you're doing. When I try to print this RIP, it is only gonna print the first seven bytes, not the eight bytes. I could just as well not bother printing that byte. This is gonna terminate the string, and the rest is never gonna go through. Therefore, if I had to put something after this, I would be hosed. You can put in one null byte in your exploit, just one, and it has to be right at the end. That's it. It turns out that's all I need. The last thing is RIP, and I need to put nulls from here on, so it'll work, but just barely. It's important to know, you can only use a null once, and it has to be the last byte of what you put in. And you can put something over here if you like, but it doesn't mean anything. It's not actually gonna enter the, prog the process. So this'll work, but it only works for that reason because the address is in little endian, and it ends in zeros, and I'm at the end of my attack. So, that's attack two. So if I run that, um, attack two, two, and put that in F, and now I run my code in GDB again, and I break vuln plus 69, and I run it from F. Now I end up here. Again, E040 to E1, E0, because nothing I've done is so drastic as to change the size of the stack. So it's 120X RSP. And I'm gonna find, here's my 90s, here's my Cs. Uh, E1, E0 is here. And so I have these zeros, this zero I wrote, that zero was already there. So this is the code I put in, 7FFFFFFE070, and that address is here. So if I continue, it should go here, and then jump here, and then slide down the knob sleds, and break here. So let's see if that works. It hit a breakpoint trap, and it hit it at 7FFFFFE0A5, which is what I expected, E0A5, one of these Cs it hit. Zero, one, two, three, I would have expected it to stop at four, but I think it did, it broke here. It executed this instruction, which was a break, and now the instruction pointer is here, ready to do, that's what it's showing me. So that's what it did. If you had compiled your program without the minus Z exec stack, then non-executable protection would be on, and it would have stopped right here on a 90. If you ever run an attack, and it hits a NOP, and the NOP won't run, that means DEP is turned on, NX. It's got to be. It can always execute a NOP. You don't need any permissions. If it can't execute a NOP, that's because NX is turned on, and that area of memory is not executable. And if that happens, you have to use return-oriented programming to do your exploit or to turn off NX but you can't run code you injected, you're gonna to have to reuse code that was already there to do the attack. And we'll do that in the later projects. Anyway, so now I can jump to there. Now all I have to do is make shell code. And I just um, make shell code as usual with MSF Bennett. Uh, I just use the same bind TCP. The only trick is use 64-bit shell code. Here's one of the main things to remember. I think I mentioned it before, but this is a cruel fact. You cannot run 32-bit 
code on a 64-bit Linux. Windows is backward compatible because it's a commercial operating system to make money, so they know that you want to use old software on your new box, and they encourage that because they want you to enjoy using your new box. Linux doesn't care, so they do not give you the libraries to support old stuff. If you have 64-bit Linux, you can't run 32-bit code on it. Now, you can go compile additional, add additional libraries to make that possible, but it's not included by default. So you have to make a native 64-bit exploit to exploit a 64-bit box. And that's just as easy as making a 32-bit exploit, but you do have to remember it. If you're used to Windows exploits, you might casually expect your 32-bit code to keep working, but not on Linux. So you make it here. This is the same shell bind stuff on Linux. Again, it's not even much bigger. This is the 64-bit assembly code that does it. And then you just paste that in your attack, and that'll give you attack three. So uh, this is all the same stuff we've done before. I don't think I need to do it live. Um, let's just take a look at the glorious attack three because there's one thing I mentioned before that's going to make a problem. So now I have this junk for the buffer, which I got from Metasploit. And all the rest of it is the same. The address is the same and everything. Again, I put a rip at the end, which is the instruction pointer. Again, it ends in zeros. And I had to, by the way, make this without any null bytes in it, with minus B, quote, backslash zero, because if there was a null byte up here, that would ruin my exploit. I'm only allowed to have one null byte down here at the end. So that's attack three. Let's get out of that and run attack three and put that in F. Now, if I run that in the debugger, and I just run from F. It inserts the stuff, echoes it back, and doesn't crash. And that's because, uh, let me make this you know, bigger. That's because it worked, and it's now listening on that process. So if I do, there, if I do net stat minus pant, I'll see it is listening on 4444. So that's what I wanted. If I do net cat to locals host, 4444, I'm in. That executes this new program, bin dash. I now have a dash shell, a remote shell. Who am I? LS and so on. I can now control this machine from there. So that's the exploit working. Now, as you probably are used to, you're going to get hosed when you try to do it on the real program. So that F works in the debugger. But if you run P13 here from F, it doesn't work and crashes. And if you want to understand that, that's why I put this print here. You can see that inside the um, debugger, it was the stack was here. The relative stack pointer was at E040, although it only printed, I think, the lower 32 bits here because of the way I wrote that code. But anyway, it ends at E040, but out here, it is at E080. So apparently, everything is 40 hexadecimal, which is 64 bytes further. So I need to add 40 to the point, and that should do it. So if I look at my code, uh, which was exploit three, I think it was exploit three, attack three, okay. Control C, I said, okay, nano, attack three. So this one was injecting the address uh, E070, so I want to add four to it, eight, nine, AB. I want to add E0, B0. I just thought I'd put that in there so you see a way to be less than just randomly guessing to do the adjustment. So if I do attack four, I just leave everything unchanged, but change that address at the end uh, to point to B0. So I moved it up 40. And now this one will run outside the debugger. So if I put attack four in F, and then I run the code here, now it didn't stop because it's still running. And if I go here, it's listening again, and I can connect here again and do, you know, who am I? So that's, uh, that number of how much it's off in the debugger seems kind of random and annoying. I've had some people say they can predict it by looking at the full path to all the referred things in the command line and counting how many bytes there are, but I've never had much luck figuring that out. I just do it by random. Chance, and if you get really irritated, then modify your code to print out a pointer. Now, the reason it printed out only 32 bits was, I think you can see it in the code here, um, P13. What I actually did here was use this command, register i int i assemble, 
And I think some part of this is only 32 bits, not 64. I'm not quite sure. Something in the C. What is that? It prints out the value of a register. So this defines a register variable, and here I print it out. Um, so I just copied this from some blog. This is a C command. So to that's, right. that's right. Yeah, this is some way to stick assembly code in line with your C. You can do that, but for some reason, I only got the lower 32 bits. And you'd have to read the C function, you know, the system call to understand probably has to do with this ASM call. This is probably a... Well, anyway, that's why I noticed I didn't get the whole thing. I didn't matter. It was good enough to get what I wanted, but but uh, that's what I got there. And here comes some chats. They may have some helpful comments. You have to do register long and I. Okay, good. Thank you. Good. That <clears throat> register long and I. Let's try that. That'd be a good thing to know. And I might add that to the project. Register long and I. Let me see. Let me get this off the screen if I can get control of my mouse. Okay. Uh, let's do... Uh, this register long int i. All right, and let's see what that what what's that? No, I don't think so. I think it's this. Well, let's try it this way and see what happens. Now let's do uh, the GCC, which was here. I see more chat coming in, but I'm going to finish this one before I try another one. Um, GCC was here with all this jazz. Okay, and uh, there, okay, yep, and now, well, no, I still don't get it, because remember, it, it's not 64 bits of zero, and then FFF, so something else still has to be changed. Now, let me look at the chat, because there may be some other tips I should do. Uh, register long int i, that should work, because int is just four bytes. Yeah, nope, that didn't do it. See, I did it that way, and I still got only the lower 64 bits, so, only 32 bits. So, you see experts, there's something not quite right about my printing registers here that could be improved, uh, and I appreciate any tips. Anyway, um, so I think that's all I wanted to show you, and I don't have any more. Um, oh, I do have one other thing that might be fun to see, but I think we ought to take a break. I have another Windows script kitty thing to show you that you might enjoy. Uh, but I see you've been listening for an hour. Let's take a 10-minute break. I'll pause the recording for 10 minutes, and we'll come back. Then I'll show you a little bit more Windows stuff. I'm going to pause this here. Zoom. All right, so we should be back here. And let me just talk about a couple things that came up during the break. Uh, there was an issue how to move things to a different port. And it was pretty easy, but in, in case other people are interested, also um, how to show the 64 bits. A student put up an answer that worked. So let me get back to my Kali machine, and let's, I just want to show you those two things that people have seen here. So if I look at my p13.c, this is the way you print out the full 64-bit register. You put a register long instead of just register, and when you print it, you print with LX instead of just X. Then you'll get the full 64-bit value. That's all I did, a long here and a long there. What I was doing before was taking a 64-bit register and putting it in a 32-bit C data item. So when I printed it out, I'd only get 32 bits. And so if you run that, now you get the full register. Here is the first six, first 32 bits, and there's the second 32 bits. So that's the real story. And, and the other thing, uh, another student asked a question, uh, how do these zeros hurt you? And the only thing that they do to hurt you is you can't put anything after them. So if you have an exploit where you have a small number of bytes needed to hit the EIP and you try to put shell code after it, you won't be able to do that in this kind of case because the zeros will terminate it. You'd have to make a trampoline that jumps or that uh, staged attack that runs a small attack and then loads more malware from the command and control server again or something. Um, and the other issue that we were talking about was if you want to make this stuff, um, but you port number, the default port number is in use. You just do this. You put L port equals 655 or whatever number you want here, and that'll make a Python exploit that listens on any port you want. And also, just for completeness, I should repeat that this attack we're using here is a miserable weak attack that won't really work on a real server because we're just opening a listening port on some goofy number, and only an idiot would fall for that. You should have a firewall on your server that only lets traffic through on the ports you're using. 
so that if somebody launches some listening process, it won't connect. What you really should be using is a reverse shell that phones home from the server to you, which is typically allowed. Although a smart server administrator would block that too, but for a typical like Windows client machine, it allows you to make connections to every port. Um, at a proper company, you would not let your server connect to the internet. You just serve requests that come in on the port and you wouldn't, like nobody could go on the server and open a browser and surf and download something on the server. You shouldn't be letting people do that. And if you did that, then even a remote shell wouldn't work. It's a good defense procedure, but a lot of people don't think of that. Anyway, I thought I just wanted to show you a little CTF. Uh, there's a Windows CTF, uh, not a CTF, but a practice thing from um, Exploit Labs, I think, that I was doing for another class. And I thought this was more good uh, script kitty stuff for you to learn for hacking Windows machines. So here, I got a crack at four and a crack at 12. If I run the crack at four, yeah, it needs a password and I didn't solve it. So if you want to solve this one, you can just do it with the immunity debugger or Ollie. Then you just open the crack at here. And you can just read what it's doing. It is very easy to just read the code here. So here's the code. It's going to open this folder called folder slash dot create me. It's going to call the create file a Windows API call, which is going to open an existing file. It says create file, but it's lying. What it's really doing is just opening an existing file. I'm going to zoom in for the benefit of the people in the room. And, um, then it's going to read that file. It's going to read 57 bytes from that file. And then it's going to compare it to this string. I don't know how to solve this, so please tell me. So you have to put exactly that text in the file. It will then read it, and now you'll pass. That's why I thought it's kind of cute. So let me um, find that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to follow this in the dump. Immediate value. That puts it down here. Now I should be able to copy that. So please give me a hint exclamation point. If I right click, I should be able to copy to clipboard. Uh, now I should be able to make that file. So that's just um, notepad and paste that file. Yeah, that's pretty annoying. I didn't get what really what I wanted there. There's probably a better way to copy it, but I guess I'll just do this. I'm sure there, I think in the past, I actually figured out how to copy out of the debugger without getting all this extra junk, but I didn't remember how to do it now. Okay, there. All right. All right. I hope I did that. Looks like I missed a space. Okay, that looks pretty close. So save that as it's got to be in the location. Um, up here, folder dot create me. So I file save as I'm running from the desktop. So it's the desktop folder, and I gotta save it as dot create me in lowercase. And then not put a text file extension on it. That should do it. I see there's already one there, which is fine. I'm going to replace it. And now if I run this thing, that should let me in. So this was crack at four, I think. Yeah. So it's done. Where's the solution? You'll find it. And what it does is it writes back into the same file. So you go into the folder, you open this with a notepad. And there's the solution. So it's kind of cute. And the thing I wanted to show you is just that you can just read these. There's another one here called crack at four, which is similar. Um, 
and you can again just read what it's doing here. So often it's very nice. You can just see what it's going to do here. Uh, that may be the same one. Yes, yeah, the same one. But anyway, there's another one here that's similar. You can often do a lot just reading it there. And in the projects, let me just make sure you guys are on track for the Windows projects because to do the Windows exploits, which we've begun talking about, I'm using a program called uh, Vuln Server. So this is something somebody put on the internet and I found it and it's very nice. Vuln Server comes as a zip file. You have to unzip it. One common thing students do is double click this and then try to run it in here and you can't do that. When you double click a folder on Windows, for some ungodly reason, it does not unzip it. It just lets you look inside it without unzipping it. So when you try to run programs in there, they usually won't run because these support programs don't exist. You have to right click and unzip it. So it really unzips into a folder here, and then you can run it. And this will now start listening, waiting for client connections. It is a sort of little imitation email server. So now you can connect from another machine. Uh, let me find my IP address here, which is right click. Oh, come on, don't mess with me. Okay, here's one, IP config. Okay, um, 172.16.1.252, and I can do netstat minus BAN pipe more, and that will show me that I am listening on port 9999, and that is the vuln server.exe. So it's listening on this address, 172.16.1.248. So I can connect from over here and see what this server does. And so if I go here, um, let me make my window a little smaller so it'll both fit on the screen. Okay, so here's my Kali machine. And so I netcat to 172.16.1.248 on 9999. And I must have fouled it up. Um, was it not? <laughs> oh, I'm missing a dot. Why, thank you. That'll do it. Good. There we are. Network is unreachable. All right. What is this nonsense? Um, IF config. Oh, I've lost my networking completely. I don't know how that happened. ETH0 up. Well, that. Looks a little better. Okay. Uh, hmm. All right. IF config. ETH0 is no address. A root. This is on NAT and it's connected. This one is on, uh, stop it. This one is also on NAT and it's connected. So let's do DH client. Minus V ETH zero, that should give me a new IP address. Okay, and now I should finally be able to connect. Right. Now maybe that's the wrong address. 172 172.16.1.248. 172.16.1.248. 16.1, come on, come on, okay. Come on. 252, ah, well that'll do it, okay. So, finally, welcome to vulnerable server. So if you type A, it says unknown command. If you type help, it shows you the command, stat, trun, srun, gdog. These are supposed to be like email commands, but they're just random words and they each take different things. So there are in fact like a dozen vulnerabilities here and you can practice exploiting them all. The simple one is trun. So if I run the trun command on AAA, trun is complete. And if I feed in more, I can eventually crash it. So for this one, uh, let me get up the project instructions, which are, somewhere in here, Vuln Server. This is project nine I'm talking about. So once you get your machine up and running, then you can send a fuzzer. And I called it VS Fuzz One. VS Fuzz One. I uh, thought I had it, but I must have put it on a different machine or something. Let's try LS. All right. I put it on a machine somewhere, but I must have uh, put it in another folder or something. 
Uh, I'm just going to run the fuzzer here to show you how this works. I'm not planning to do the whole project, but I want you to get started on your Windows machine. And these are the steps that people often get stuck on. So there's my fuzzer. So this fuzzer now is going to connect with Python to the socket. And here's a little bit more Python than we've done before. You import the socket library. You create a uh, socket object here. And you don't need to fill in any of this junk. That's the default for IP version 4. But you can. Then you connect to the server on the port number. So I have to fix that server address to point to the right address, which in my case is 172. 161252, I think. Yeah. Okay, so now it'll connect. Now it's going to connect and it's going to send trun dot and then the attack. And the attack is going to be as many bytes as you told it to send. It's going to send that and then it's going to print whatever comes back. That's what this program does. So I'm going to shamode plus x on the VS program and then run it. And it's uh, going to send 500 bytes. And when I do Trun Complete Goodbye, it didn't crash. And you can tell over here that it didn't crash because you can see it's still running. A client came in, a client left. So 500 is not enough to overflow it. So we can try 1,000. And it says goodbye and doesn't crash. It's still running, so I can try 2,000. Now it crashes. And when it crashes, Windows gives you some information. App crash, um, not a lot of information, but it tells you it crashed and it gives you some information about, uh, what's that? i see if I can. Yeah, yeah. So it tells you a timestamp and which module it filled inside some dill, but it doesn't give you any register values or anything useful. So the thing that works now is to run it in a debugger. So you run immunity and you could run it inside here, or you could connect to it as a running process. Either one works fine. Just remember that when you load it in a debugger, as I was complaining earlier about GDB, Windows debuggers do put a breakpoint at the start and run the process. So they start paused. You have to run it or it's not listening or anything. So you have to run it here with this little write arrow. Now it's running. She was running down here in the corner. Now it's listening on that port. So I can move this to the side and send this attack again and send 2000. And it crashes over here. And now at the bottom, it says access violation and writing to 41, 41, 41, 41. It's not projecting very well in here, but I think I can zoom in for the people in this room. Uh, right at the bottom is where it shows you that access violation up. I, my computer has got too many other things happening. There, writing to 41, 41, 41, 41. This is what GDB would put at the bottom in text. And you can see it up here in um, the register, right there. You can see EDI is 41, 41. EIP is down here someplace. Anyway, it's about to. So it didn't put that number in the EIP. It tried to write to that address, 41, 41, 41, 41. Now, this is something I warned you about before. You can hit different exploits depending on how it crashed. So here, um, once you get your immunity working, and this explains the layout of immunity, which we've already talked about, here it tried to write to 41, 41, 41. So what we have now is a write where we control the address. It's not even clear that we control the data being written to that address. So this is not very easy to exploit. An uncontrolled write. It would be better to find another crash. And all you have to do is change the length of your crash. Um, I sent 3,000 and I got, with 3,000, I get an execution error. So this is something I mentioned before and why I say once you find a length of attack, Never let the length change because there could be multiple crashes. 2,000 crashes in one part of code, 3,000 crashes in a different part of code, 10,000 in a different part of code. So let's send 3,000. I'm going to restart this stuff. I can just do file, a debug restart in immunity. Okay. And then it's paused again, so I have to hit the arrow to run it again. Now it's listening. Now if I send 3,000 instead of 2,000. 
It crashes, but it did not crash the same way. And I'm going to try and zoom in without going nuts here. There, access violation when executing 41, 41, 41, 41. Now we control the EIP. So this is actually one of the main uses of this Vuln server thing. You get practice fuzzing. There are a lot of different crashes in this product, and you have to hunt and find them. But in this case, you know, I guide you through one. That now we have the easy kind of thing to exploit. We now control the EIP. So all we have to do now is insert Metasploit code and jump to it, and it's very much like what we've done on uh, Linux. So you put in uh, non-repeating pattern of characters to see where it hits, and you'll get a pattern down here, one, A, two, five, is what I put in. So I put in uh, code. Here is what you figure out, put in some non-repeating pattern to find out where the bytes are that end up in the EIP, because all I know now is they're somewhere in that 3,000 A's. And then, um, now that you can hit it exactly, you can target the EIP by putting a BCDE in. So you can hit it here with BCDE. This is exactly what we did over and over in Linux, doing it on Windows. You can now target the EIP exactly. And now, you can examine the memory at the point of a crash. Um, and after you do the exploit, you get Fs at the end here because my exploit code had um, Fs at the end of its padding. Then you test for bad characters by putting in bytes to see what's going to get through. And then you're going to make the same kind of thing that we've done before. Um, all right. And we'll, I'm not going to talk about this next time, I think. I don't think I want to go any deeper into it today. But um, what we did was we found a module that was vulnerable that we can exploit easily. So we'll come back to this next time. I think I'll walk through this part of the project in detail. But the MONA is very useful because remember these defenses we've been talking about, address space layout randomization, non-executable stack, and some others we'll talk about later, like safe SEH. These are the defenses that stop these simple attacks. And the simplest way to exploit Windows is to just find a module that does not use these defenses. Microsoft added it to their servers and all their clients software starting with Vista, but it's not on all the time. And as you can see, there are some modules that don't use the defenses, and these attacks will work. All you have to do is find an overflow on them, and in particular, the Vuln server itself does not use them. This is a very common situation. Remember I said Windows has backward compatibility. You can run 32-bit code on a 64-bit system. You can also run old code on a new system. But when you do, it generally does not turn on the new defenses, and it's vulnerable. And that's what's happening here. So anyway, we'll go through that in more detail next time. I think we've done enough for one day here. Um, all right. So any questions about anything? Well, I guess that's it. I'm going to stop the share. I'll go upstairs and help anybody who wants to work in the lab there. Um, all right. That'll do for one day.